got, I've really only got three things that I want to add to the enormous amount that's been said this evening, and it's all fascinating, and it's all really good. I just have three things that I want to add very briefly, and if I spend five minutes, minutes on each of those, then uh, I think uh, Patrick will probably not, not kick me out. I want to talk for five minutes about image, for five minutes about chains, and for five minutes about students. There's a very old and wise African proverb which says, the hand which receives is always beneath the hand which gives, and how wise that is. And one of the reasons why I've always liked CDI from the very first contact I had with it is because instinctively it understood that there's something wrong with the idea that one is giving down because it creates its own traps. And when you are receiving charity, you're receiving aid, that puts you inextricably in a lower position, which damages your self-esteem, it damages your reputation in the eyes of others, and it ends the possibility of any long-term development. This is the thing that needs to change. And initiatives like this are very, very good at starting to change that because they're all about doing business, collaborating, working together with people who happen to be in less fortunate situations, less well-governed countries, but in all other respects, our peers, our equals, and on occasion, our superiors. That, it seems to me, has got to be the fundamental core that runs through everything that goes on. That's beginning to happen. Now, the image of Africa as the desperate basket case is one of the biggest problems that Africa faces. It is the symptom, and to some degree also the cause of Africa's troubles. And the development industry, if I may call it that, is partly responsible for this. Because with the best possible intentions over many, many decades, it has painted a portrait of Africa as being a desperate, hopeless basket case. For the very good reason of wishing to stimulate people's charity. And in some respects, it's been enormously effective at doing so. And it's very hard to criticize, for example, some of the, the media celebrities who've been so effective in generating so much charity for African countries. And yet criticize them we must, because for decades they used the enormous influence they had over global public opinion, standing as often as not in front of a black logo representing Africa for all the world as if it were one country and presenting an image of a hopeless basket case, a place where all you'll find is suitable recipients for charity. Once you've started feeling guilty about a place, it's very, very hard to change your mind and start thinking about that as a place where you could do business, where you could benefit yourself in some way, and yet benefiting yourself is at the heart of every sane and profitable transaction that humanity has ever engendered. Once we believe that Africa is a basket case, then the road is closed to every other engagement but charity. I'm not gonna invest in a basket case because I'll lose my shirt. I'm not gonna go on holiday in a basket case because I'll get knifed. I'm not even gonna buy a product that's made in a country that's a basket case because it will fall apart. This is the problem. Now the reason why Africa is now beginning to emerge is because that image is now beginning to change. Part of this kind of work is about helping that image to change, is about reteaching people, A, that this is not one country. This is 52 or 53 or whatever it is countries, all quite different, all with their own history, their own geography, their own culture, their own aims, their own aspirations, their own different stages of development, to teach people more about Africa so that people begin to understand something about it and through understanding comes more respect and through respect comes the opportunity to trade and to benefit each other in a reciprocal way. That, it seems to me, is terribly important. How do you change the image of an entire continent? Well, by being very imaginative and very creative and very bold about the way you did it. I remember a few years ago, an absolutely hysterical meeting I had with the government of Botswana, who were at the time celebrating 40 years of stable democracy, and we were trying to think of ways in which they could let the world know that, at least in that respect, this was no basket case. So I suggested that since this was around about the time when uh, George W. Bush uh, was about to be uh, allegedly re-elected as the President of the United States, Botswana should send an election monitoring team to Florida <laughs> to make sure that the process was free and fair. 
Now, it's funny that you laugh because the government of Botswana was also falling about laughing when I suggested this. And I said to them, why are you laughing? This joke is at your expense. And at that moment, they stopped laughing and started thinking. And you know, we did it, and it was a great success. The second part of the idea was for the Botswana Air Force to start flying over some of the poorer districts of Los Angeles and dropping sacks of rice out of a helicopter. But <laughs> there were problems with that connected with <laughs> overflying rice. It's about creative behavior. It's about having the courage and the imagination to behave in a way which communicates dramatically who you really are so that people get the message. Creative is a word which often is bandied around in a careless way. I have a simple definition for what is creativity. Creative is the opposite of boring. It's as simple as that. And part of the problem about so much bad governance and so much bad development work is that it's boring. And when it's boring, it's done according to the standard recipe. It seldom works, not merely because the standard recipe often doesn't work, but because it doesn't catch anybody's imagination. And this brings me to my second point, which is the point about chains. Mark Twain, the funniest and wisest man who ever lived, once created a fantastic definition for education. He said, education is not filling a bucket, it's lighting a fire. In other words, if you're trying to teach somebody, it's not about pouring your information into their head because the human brain can't receive information in that way and in those quantities. It's about setting a fire under their bottoms so that they become infused and infused with the desire to learn themselves. And that's how things get transmitted. These kinds of projects will work only if they are seen as the beginning of a chain reaction Lord Alton told the wonderful story at the beginning about the boy and the starfishes. And it's absolutely right. When you look at the problems that are facing us, not just in Africa, but in so many parts of the world, it's easy to become very discouraged and to say, the problems are so huge and I'm so tiny. And there'll be a moment when all of us will say, is it really worth it? Will I really make a difference, despite all the satisfactions that I'm getting and occasionally giving? Well, my answer to that is it can work if we begin to treat these transactions of assistance and development as the beginning of a chain reaction. Not a single gesture that finishes at the moment where the help is received and enjoyed and made use of by an individual, but the beginning of a chain of aid that travels around the world and continues to travel. I've just done a project with the government of uh, Austria, which amongst many, many other things, looked at the way in which Austria gives aid. Like so many rich countries, Austria gives assistance in other countries in boring ways. One of the things they were going to do was to send some engineers to help rebuild the bridge in the center of Accra in Ghana, which is very important uh, to the life in Accra and which is in a bad state. Boring. They were going to send some boring Austrian engineers and fix the bridge in a boring way. It's fine. I don't want to knock it, but it is, you've got to admit, pretty boring. We came up with the idea of chain aid, that there's a new conditionality to this, uh, to this project. And the conditionality is very simple. We'll help you and we'll teach you how to fix this bridge on condition that afterwards you go and teach somebody else how to do the same thing. In other words, you, the recipients, become the donors. You won't be able to do it after one project and we'll stick with you and we'll help you to learn. But gradually, we want to see that team of engineers in Accra who have learned how to fix their own bridge from the Austrian engineers one day helping perhaps building a bridge in Sierra Leone and one day perhaps after that helping to build a bridge in Vancouver. Why not? These things can and must move in every possible direction because only when aid and assistance and collaboration is moving in every direction, not just from north to south and west to east, will the problem finally begin to be resolved. The way that things catch fire, the way that things transmit, the way that they become chain reactions is when they're creative, when they're inspiring, so creative and so inspiring that a seven-year-old can tell you the story without a script. Some of these stories up here are very, very good examples of that. They're not dull, they're not boring, they're not complicated. And because they're simple, and because they're exciting, and because they're inspiring, they inspire others, and the chain reaction starts to happen. This is so very important. And it's important also because when you are living a life of misery, when you're surrounded by poverty and disease and injustice, this has a tendency to reduce you to a state of lethargy and powerlessness. I think we've all felt that occasionally at certain times. Even in our own very lucky lives, we know what that feeling is. 99% of humanity under that condition will become lethargic. 
And one of the reasons why you guys are having so much success in Africa at the moment is because you are infecting these people with your enthusiasm. And you're reminding them that actually where there's a will, there's a way. And if you're creative and enthusiastic and imaginative, then things can really start to happen. And almost that's the most valuable thing you're doing. You're bringing a little spark of creativity and hope to people's lives, which will galvanize them uh, to, to, to take the initiative. I said I was going to talk about students, and I want to talk about students. I love students because students, unless they're very mature students, have not yet reached the age where they've learned how to demonstrate their intelligence to others by spotting the flaws in other people's ideas. This is the most corrosive evil in society. The fact that so many people in so many meetings in a million places around the world at this very moment are demonstrating their intelligence to other people in the meeting by showing exactly why other people's ideas won't work. Now, in development, I've met a great many very talented and very well-motivated people. But I've also met a great many people who are really nothing much more than experts in why things can't work. And there's a tendency in the development business, I'm sure you've come across this as well, to become really rather cynical, perhaps without even realizing it, and to be able to cite flawlessly, without notes, 857 reasons why things won't work. It's tremendously important to fight this and fight it for the rest of your lives. One of the reasons why a student initiative of this sort is so very valuable is because you, I hope, haven't got to that stage yet. When I speak to students about some of the projects I'm trying to do, the thing I love about them is that their immediate instinct is to believe and to love and to follow it wherever it goes because it has some moral or emotional power that they like. They don't say, ah, well, clever, but of course, you know why that won't work. So hang on to that. Call it what you want. Innocence, lack of experience, idiocy. But it's the most valuable quality that you have because that's what the Americans call the can-do attitude. And that's really all I wanted to say. It's a little bit fluffy, but I hope it might be of some value to you. And I'll finish with um, another very wise African proverb which comes to mind uh, when we're thinking about the hugeness of the problem facing us. There are two good times to plant a tree. The best good time is 40 years ago. The next best good time is right now. Thanks.